Hello, everybody. What's up? Welcome to Discovering Nicole. That would be me, the triple double G Nicole. <laughs> um, we are live at six o'clock today because we have a special guest speaker coming on to share their story. And that would be Cassie from Wildflower Tea. So come on in and hang out for a while with us. If you guys don't mind, help me by sharing the video, liking the video and inviting your friends, sharing the video, liking the video and inviting your friends. And I'm going to do the same thing real fast while we're chit chatting over on Facebook. So for those of you guys that are new to my YouTube channel, um, I like to make content about addiction and recovery. And sometimes I get tired of talking on my, uh, about myself. So then I like to have people come on and tell their stories. So that's what we're doing tonight. Let me draw this blind really fast so that way it doesn't blind you guys. Um, so that's what we're doing tonight. Cassie's going to come tell her story tonight. So that way I don't have to talk about myself. <laughs> no, but really I like to interview people. And for those of you guys that are just coming around and hanging out with us, I have 150 interviews on this channel. So if you guys like hearing people's stories of recovery, um, go to my playlist. It's literally labeled interviews and you'll find over 150 interviews of people that are, have came on and shared their stories of addiction and recovery. Um, we support all pathways to recovery here. So it doesn't matter if you're abstinent. It doesn't matter if you're on MAT. It doesn't matter if you are a person who uses THC or CBD or uh, Kratom. It doesn't matter. Like as long as you're like improving your life and you're trying to be a better person than the way you were when you were in active addiction, then we support you. Um, what we don't support is like, you know, staying in your own old behavior and being um, treating people disrespectfully and being nasty to people. And we try to support people where they're at. If you're still actively using drugs, we're not going to shame you or ask you to leave. You can hang out with us, of course. Um, we just ask that if you're still getting high, that you don't try to, you know, give people drugs in the chat or try to tempt people into coming over there and doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. You know what I'm saying? But if you're getting fucked up and you're trying to change your life and you want to start hanging out with people who have already changed your, their lives, then you're more than welcome to hang out with us here on my channel. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I was just trying to share this everywhere that I thought I needed to share it. Okay. I think I did that. I did good. Okay. Hey guys. Hey, Amy. Hey, John. What's up? Hey, Allie. So um, I think Cassie was just getting her kids um, all situated. Uh, so as soon as she gets that done, we'll be going um, and we'll talk. We'll, we'll hear her story. Look at my pretty necklace, y'all. I'm wearing it today, my opal necklace. I'm so happy. So I decided to layer it today with this little puff heart that I have. Now, when my husband worked, um, my husband used to work for a jewelry store. They actually gave these little puff hearts away for free. And this is solid silver. It's like pretty heavy. And then I have this little wishbone with diamonds in it. And I just put it on there too. Because they're. I figured I could like layer it. <laughs> and then my ears are almost healed from the piercings. So I'm going to be able to wear different earrings soon in my ears. And I'm really excited. And then I've got my, my Samsung watch on. And then my you know, opal, opal, and then my wedding ring. So that's our jewelry for today. And then I have no makeup on and just a little bit of lip gloss and my, my favorite lip gloss. So that's all. I've been kind of hanging out and laying low the last couple days because what will happen is I'll go on like a, a, a I'll go on a spree where I go live like every single day. And my husband even asked me about it. He goes, you haven't gone on your live stream. And I'm like, it's only been one day. <laughs> but it's because I get so used to going on it all the time that when I don't, it kind of feels like something's missing. You know what I'm saying? But I was actually talking to one of my friends, y'all, on Facebook. I'm not going to say who it was, but he actually, we were talking about 
I made a video on, um, I mean, I'm not, I made a post on Facebook that was saying, since, since YouTube demonetized me, I started an OnlyFans and I left a link to, um, my Patreon in the comment section of this, com of this post, right? And all these people were freaking out, like thinking that I had really done it. Some people were being like really kind of upset with me for doing it. And then some people were laughing because they could get the joke, you know? And um, one of my friends messaged me and he was like, hey, did YouTube really de demonetize you? And I was like, yeah. And they did the same thing to him. Um, and I thought, wow. So what I think happened is after they monetized shorts, they went through and just did a sweep of everybody's channels. So it wasn't just me. A lot of people were trying to think it was some conspiracy, like, you know, it's no conspiracy. Like a lot of people got hit just like I did. And it was because they were like doing a sweep and going through everybody's channels after they monetized shorts. Um, so I will reapply uh, for it in April, y'all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you guys help me uh, go through all my content and make sure that I take down any videos that are like reposts. You know, I'm going to go through first and I'm going to go through and look through all of it, take all the ones down. And then if you guys see any that I don't see, let me know. Okay. Um, but anyway, let me see if she's, I don't see. Yeah. She's not here yet. Okay. <clears throat> I'm excited to hear Cassie's story though. Um, I've never, I don't really know her whole story. I don't know what drugs that she was on. So I'm really excited about it. I gotta find, I have to show you guys this new lady I found on, on Etsy who does rings y'all. And are y'all are going to freak out when y'all see this lady's, um, Oh, let me see. Let me show y'all what I'm talking about. Hey, what's up? What's up, Patricia? I think yes, I think it is too a bunch of bull. I could honestly, I could fight people. About, I could fight YouTube about that, but we're not going to do that. Um, I want to show you guys these. Um, y'all know I'm obsessed with opals. Anybody that's new here, I have an obsession with silver jewelry, specifically opals and um. I have just been ordering my way through opal jewelry, having the best time of my life. Okay. But I found this new girl who does opal jewelry and I want to show you guys, um, her, Ooh, that's really pretty her, um, work because it's really pretty. Oh, cool. And if you're somebody who likes like stuff like that, you'll, you'll, ex you'll like appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, okay. We'll just start from the beginning. So this is one of her. Now look at this. Look at the band. She does these cute little stamps on the band. Isn't that the prettiest? Ah, oh, I thought it was so cute. Now look at this one. I mean, that is gorgeous. I mean, do you see the rainbow in that stone? Cassie. She asked me to refer to her as Cassie because I was calling her by uh, her other name, the other name, and she specifically asked me to call her Cassie. Um, I mean, I, this is my goal, you guys. My goal is to have an opal on every finger by the end of this year. <laughs> I showed my husband, like, you know how when people, like, will renew their vows and stuff like that? This is what I want. When me and my husband, like, do something like that, when we, like, renew our vows or whatever, our vows, our vows, <laughs> I want this. I want to show y'all what I want. I want to get my jewelry from this place. Her name is Sarah Gardner. Sarah Gardner Fine Jewelry. Look at these fucking opal rings, y'all. That is what I want my wedding ring to look like when we renew our vows. When we renew our vows, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. 
Do you see the two in the middle, dude? Like those are stunning. Okay, girl, see you when you get here. Look at this one, y'all. It literally looks like a freaking, look at that. Uh, so that's what I want. I just love them. I think they're so beautiful. And they they just are just, they feel good to, I don't know what it is. I don't like diamonds. You know what I'm saying? Now, of course, when my husband got me this ring, um, when we first met and when we first got engaged and everything, like back then, I didn't understand the beauty of like gemstones, right? Oh, no, Neil. Oh, same spot? <laughs> I didn't understand the beauty of gemstones. So I was like, wanted a diamond. I wanted a diamond. You know, if I, if I went back in time, I would totally want like an opal with like some beautiful gemstones, like surrounding it for my wedding band and everything now, because I just think they're so much more pretty, you know, diamonds are like such a ripoff. You know what I mean? They're just, I feel like they're the way that the uh, society rips us off, you know? And did you know that there's like, um, they sell you like those lab created ones. If you buy a lab created diamond, it's worth $0 if you ever try to trade it in or anything like that. I didn't know that. Okay. Enough stone talk. Let me get Cassie on here. Hey girl. Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm really excited to hear your story because I've never heard it before. So I'm pumped. Um, yeah. Let me tell you. So this is how we do it. You know, it's really simple. Um, I just, I basically let you take the floor and I would just like you to share with us what it was like when you were growing up as a kid, kind of like share with us, like, you know, did you come from a two parent household? Did you experience any trauma and take us into how um, growing up, you know, how you got into using substances okay. and then um, what it was like during your substance uh, abuse and how bad it got and then what your life is like now. And that's okay. it. Okay. Awesome. I was going to ask you, do you want me to tell it all? Because I mean, there's, you know, but I didn't want to. No, I mean, as wrong. much as you're comfortable with sharing, whatever <laughs> you're comfortable with sharing, like, um, like I would kind of like, like, so when I, when I tell my story about when I was a kid, I kind of try to like, um, touch on the points, like, as in I was insecure, I struggled with my, with my weight. Yes. I always felt like I couldn't fit in. Um, I talked a little bit about my sister cause she had bipolar disorder and that kind of like affected our family cause we didn't understand like, um, mental illness and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I try to like touch on the things that I feel like really kind of influenced my life at a young age to where yeah, I started absolutely. to use drugs. You know what I mean? I agree. Well, and that's, that's the thing. When I told you it was so complex, it really does start that young, you know? So I was like, does she want me to start from the beginning, beginning? So that's what I'll do. I just, I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. I'm um, going to mute myself and you just take the, if I have any questions, I'll just come in and ask you, but I'm just going to listen. Okay. 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 Awesome. Okay, cool. Okay. So Okay, so I was born in Sarasota, Florida, and we lived. I lived there with my mom and my dad for the first two to three years of my life. My father is um, an alcoholic, and he has been for majority of his life. So, unfortunately, <clears throat> he chose that lifestyle over being a father. And so, around the age of two, three years old, me and my mom who she didn't really have a whole lot of family. It was just her and me. Uh, we ended up on the road and just, we, it was just a struggle for the first four to five years of my life. We were house jumping, staying with friends in different States all over the world. Um, there were times that we lived in cars in the parking lot, you know, situation. And there's been, I always say that there's been angels that's kind of, came into my life and, and saved me in a lot of ways or redirected my path throughout my life because around the age of three, um, me and my mom were staying in the car in a food line parking lot in North Carolina and a woman came out and seen us, just a random woman. And she took us in. She had seen us there several, several nights or whatever and seen that my mom had a little baby. So she came over just to ask. And next, next thing you know, she's like, well, y'all can come stay with me. Took us in out and, you know, didn't know us from Adam and got my mama a job at Foodline. Um, 
So from there, around the age of three, three to four, um, that's when was the first taste of stability I'd had. And I was super young. So I do have memories of those things, but very, very blurry, like vague memories here and there of just, you know, staying at her friend's house, then finally getting to the point where we could be in our own place. And it wasn't much, you know, but it, it was ours. <laughs> and then um, from there, when I was and my dad, I didn't really see my dad. He didn't really come around or anything like that. But my mom, um, she was what I would consider. And I didn't know this till much later on in life. Um, but I know it now. <laughs> she is what she considers to be a high functioning addict. Um, so I didn't know until I was about 16 years old that she even struggled with substance abuse. But she struggled her whole, her whole life. So, um, she was doing that, you know, and working as much as she could work. And then when I was about five is when she met my stepfather or stepdad and the only man I ever called dad. So when he came into our life, things, things really changed. Like he just came in and was like our saving grace. He got us out of that little rickety mobile home. You know, we got our own, our own place, a piece of land, all these things, really hard worker. And he, he didn't do anything. The worst thing that he ever done was drink a cold beer after a hard week's, you know, work or whatever. How, how do you think she never, can I, she says, how do you think your mom managed to not get caught up by CPS or something? You know what I'm saying? Because well, I, I can't, I, I can imagine like seeing you guys sleeping in that car at, with a baby. My friend fell asleep in the car with her kid, just fell asleep. And somebody called CPS on her. Well, um, I think the only reason why is because we moved around state to state okay. so much. Okay. So we were in one place for long and North Carolina was the first like place we stayed in, you know, from there we had been Virginia, Tennessee, Florida, all over Georgia. And it was very much that. And she, again, she didn't have any family or anything, but I, what I will say is um, once she did get stable and she got a job and she got a place and all these things, my father, my sperm donor's family started really like trying to fight with her about custody and stuff. And that was like a whole, a whole crazy thing where, um, she let me go stay with them one Sunday and my dad, my sperm donor took me and my mama didn't see me for several months. And had to go through the whole court. So she didn't get me took away. Um, but because they didn't have anything written up, she did have to go through a custody battle and she did have to fight it. And it was such bullshit because my dad tried to say that I was sexually molested. Like, I don't know what I can say on here. You can say whatever um, you want to say. Okay. Um, so when he got me, when he got me, he had a new girlfriend. And basically the only reason he even wanted me was because she wanted a little girl. So he got me, I went and stayed with my grandma. My grandma had talked my mama into let me stay that or that weekend. And I was supposed to be back home that Sunday at six o'clock. And my mom says like, when six o'clock rolled around and I wasn't there, she started freaking out. Nobody would answer. And by the time she got in touch with my grandmother, my biological grandmother, I was already gone with my father. Um, so they had already, they had set up this thing, took me. And then for the next several months, um, <clears throat> it was this custody battle where he was, he had me in child therapy and I, I don't remember any of it, but I was in child therapy. Uh, he tried to say that I had been sexually molested and all I had was a, a yeast infection. So there was a lot of stuff like that going on. And then towards the, he wouldn't let me talk to my mom or my mom talked to me or let my mom know where we, where I was. And my mom is back, like fighting this, you know, with everything she's got. And by the end of it, um, when him and that girl broke up just a few months later, he basically was like, oh, well, you can have just gave me back after giving my mama all this trouble yeah. gave me back and said, you can have her. I, you know, I don't I don't even want her. What a douchebag. He, he didn't show up to court. He wrote a letter that his attorney like turned in or whatever. 
saying that he wasn't going to fight it and he didn't want to push it. So from there, the judge told my mom, I would never let him back in her life if I was you. And she didn't for until I got much older and like made my own choices and decisions. She did not. <laughs> um, but after that whole ordeal, <laughs> Um, by that time, you know, she she had to be on her P's and Q's too. I mean, this is a custody battle. So she had to make sure she had a house and had a car and had all these things, a job, work, all that stuff. And she had all that worked out. So when I got back into the home, I would say it was maybe maybe a year or two later when she met my stepdad and they got married super, super quick within seven months. <clears throat> and he was an act literal angel. I mean, the hardest working man I've ever met in my life. Like I said before, he didn't have any history of substances, came from a good, good, big family. Um, I wasn't used to that. So <clears throat> with him, it not only came like stability, but it also came a family dynamic I never had. Um, and just so much stuff. So from the age of like five to six, to 13, I had what I would consider your average childhood, a, a really good, decent childhood. Um, you know, we lived in the middle of nowhere. I had a lot of land to play, lots of cousins to play with. I wasn't around anything bad or anything of that nature, but I did always, I've always struggled with anxiety. Um, I had child anxiety as a child. Um, and just, I'm an overthinker. I overthink everything. So <laughs> at the age of 13, I kind of, it's the, your, your basic story of getting in with the wrong crowd, I guess you could say. Oh. And I got in with the wrong crowd, started kind of recreationally drinking and, and smoking cannabis, but it was very recreational. And for the, for three years, I, I would say, from 13 to 16, it was just recreational, just for fun, partying with friends on the weekends, summertime, just doing teenage stuff. You know, yeah. um, I did also experiment with opiates, but and benzos as well. But it was so, so recreate, like very, very seldom. And to be honest, at that point in my life, I wasn't, that wasn't my thing. Like, I didn't like the way it made me feel. I didn't like anything about it <clears throat> as a teenager. I yeah. did like how cannabis made me feel though, because it really, really calmed my anxiety. It made me just happy and calmer and things didn't pile up so heavy so quickly. Um, so by the age of 16, I was a bona fide pothead, <laughs> a bona fide <laughs> pothead. Um, and I smoked every day, you know, and that was just kind of, and then from there I started smoking cigarettes. So cigarettes and, and cannabis became like an everyday thing. And then I would still recreationally, um, drink when I was out and about with, um, friends or whatever, but, but it wasn't a problem, you know? Yeah. Um, but at 16, the day I turned 16, I ended up dropping out of school the day I turned 16 because I was just so, I was just really in a rebellious stage and my parents did not want me to drop out. They fought me tooth and nail. I mean, my daddy, even at, at 15 years old, walked me into that high school, holding my hand, making sure I made it to class. But the second his back was turned, you know, I would skip and you know, for, unfortunately, I had a friend that lived right beside the school. So it was just so easy to do. Yeah. Um, so that happened and I ended up dropping out of school. And the the rule, if I was going to stay at the house, the, the whole thing was they didn't want me to, but it had gotten to the point where the courts were going to be getting involved and they were going to get in trouble. And I didn't want them to get in trouble either. So they really had no choice but to let me. But the rule was, if you're if you drop out, you got to get a job. You got to do this. You got to do that. If you're going to live under this house. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I did. And I got my first little job at McDonald's. Um, and it did not take long at all. Within three months, I realized, like, I really screwed up here. Yeah. Because, <laughs> and I'm easier than to work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just everything, like, 
I, I still kept my job, but I went back and got um, my GED quickly because it was still fresh one and two. I just, I knew I had messed up. I wanted to go back to school, school, but I was already so far behind. I'd already, um, I was supposed to be a, I was supposed to be a junior and I was just now a sophomore and then I was behind in my sophomore year too. So I was really behind. So I just went and got my GED instead. And that was another thing that happened very quickly within three months or so. And around that time, I, I had my first little long-term boyfriend and he was a good kid. So whenever him and I got together, um, I stopped smoking pot. I stopped doing anything. He came from a really good family and, you know, church family, all these things. And I moved in with him and I quit doing all of it except smoking cigarettes. That's been my downfall forever. Um, but I did. I quit. I quit everything and things were good. And then I, we broke up after almost two years or a year and a half, almost two years. Um, we broke up and that was when I experienced like my first heartbreak and y'all know all my ladies in here know that first heartbreak, it'll get you, man. It'll get oh. you. And, and it got me and I'm already dramatic by nature anyways. So I was a wreck. I was, I was dying. I was dying inside and I just went ham. I didn't care. I just was partying with my friends, doing anything, everything I could get my hands on. I didn't want to cry. I didn't want to be sad. And it's crazy because it's, you know, I've been with my husband now over 13 years. So mm -hmm. it's like, but at that time, it's like, how can I live without this person? You get so used to this person. I know what you mean. It's hard. And so when you're young, I feel like it, it just hurts a different way because you don't really, really understand don't. how to process it, you know? Oh yeah. And I dang sure did. And so it, it sucked, but I just went through a, a fuck it phase basically and started partying all the time. It moved in with one of my girlfriends and that's, it, it was summertime. We just went crazy with smoking, drinking, you know, that was, that was the basics of it, smoking and drinking, but it became an every night thing. Uh -huh. And then little by little that summer, and it happened so quick too. little by little, like someone offered us cocaine one night. And so that started kind of getting thrown into the mix and then benzos, opiates. So it was just like this mixture of just whatever it, someone had, I was doing basically. Yeah. And on top of it, drinking and smoking too. So I was just doing everything. And that summer was a whirlwind, a, a whirlwind. But um, towards the end of that summer is when I got news. My, my father, my mom called me and she said that my dad, um, the man who raised me, my stepdad, he had found out he had stage four colon cancer. And you know, I'm already going through this heartbreak. I'm already like trying to numb all this stuff because I don't want to deal, like don't know how to deal with it. Um, and then you get news like that, you know. So I ended up moving back home and um, just trying to spend, because I mean, it was bad. They, he did the chemo. He did all of that. But by the time they found it, it was already so bad mm. that, it prolonged things, but it didn't really make a difference. And um, I, you know, I was working and trying to help financially. Um, my dad also was very stubborn and old fashioned. So he did not want a home nurse. He did not want any of that. So my, my mother and myself was his nurse. And up until literally the very end when hospice had to come in. And even then, he he didn't go to a house he refused to go to a hospice home they came into our home um so that was a really rough time and it was during that time oh, i'll never forget it i was you already don't make anything at mcdonald's i think at that time minimum wage was like 715 mm -hmm. and i was already like giving over half of that to to my mom to try to help because my, my dad couldn't work anymore and my mom didn't work, you know, and he got SSI and stuff, but 
it's just not much, you know, it, it just wasn't. So I'm giving most of my check to them, but I remember that I would allot myself $50 every check and, and I would get a quarter bag of pot, a big gallon of two finger tequila and just stay blazed all like all the time. Like, unless I was working, if I was working, I was not doing yeah. that. But any other time, um, after work, I would, I would take like six shots just back to back to back, smoke a big one and just chill, you know, because I was, I don't even know how I was functioning. I was just mentally. So I, I felt like I needed it. And that was the first yeah. time I felt that way, you know, to, to be able to function, I needed to have this substance situation. Um, and then spring break of 2009 is when I met my husband and we knew each other. We were um, mutual growing up. So we knew who each other was, but we reconnected in 2009 at a house party. I was invited to his house, him and his brother's house for a party. And um, I showed up there and I knew his name sounded familiar, but I didn't realize it till I seen him type of thing. And we just, you know, automatically we reconnected, we chatted and just had a good time, did a lot of cocaine. Um, and the, it was, sounds like my kind of party. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And it was, and that's how it was, you know? Um, yeah. and for the, for the first several months, we were just friends, like just hanging out, partying whenever I wasn't working or whatever we was hanging out. And then, he was kind of like a rebound too. It did kind of start off like that. Um, and yeah, and from there, uh, of course, obviously, I think it was maybe four or five months down the road. Um, we, he, we started kind of catching feelings for each other and it was this gradual thing. And I think the both of us was kind of scared and was like, uh, uh, no, like he wasn't one to settle down. We were young too. Like, 18, you know, so we weren't trying to settle. I just got out of a bad situation. My dad's dying, like all of this stuff. So both of us kind of got freaked out and uh, <laughs> like stopped, stopped talking for a couple of months. But um, when my dad started taking a turn for the worse, it was so crazy because one day out of the blue, we hadn't talked for like three, three, three or four months, a couple of months. And he just called me out of the blue and we talked all night and I cried to him and just all these things. And we just started talking again. But this time when um, we actually started hanging out and dating and everything, I told him minus the, the cannabis, because like I said, I was a pothead that I was not going to be, with anyone that was on drugs that I didn't want to be around drugs like that. Like I, I wasn't trying, cause I seen, I like scared myself that summer seeing how easily I got hooked on it. And that scared me. So I was like, I cannot be around it. I don't want to be around it. I've never been around it like that. And I seen how easy, how quickly it could get out of control. And his, his childhood, like, he leads, he led a very different life than me. He was raised around it and everyone around him and his family were very open, openly addicts, you know? So he's seen a lot, whereas I was too, like I came from that as well, but my mama hit it very well and my dad wasn't in my life. You know what I mean? So he's seen it, seen it and grew up seeing it. Um, and was doing hard drugs at a very like nine years old. So that's the only life he really knew. And I told him, I was like, you know, I, I, I like you and everything. Um, but I, I just can't be around it like that. And so he ended up staying, coming and staying with us. And like I said, my dad was getting really sick at this point too. So, um, and it was just me. I was the only child, me, my dad, my mom. And he came and stayed with us to basically clean out his system and get cleaned because he was on methadone really, really bad. He was doing cocaine really, really like just everything really, really bad. And he did. He came there. He 
he stopped everything cold turkey and really started helping my dad because my, my dad was getting super sick and my mom, it, like it was a homesteading situation. So wood had to be chopped and like things had to be done. The animals needed to be fed. And he really stepped up to the plate and started helping my dad a lot with those types of things, which only made me fall in love with him more because, you know, like he just, he didn't have to do any of it. He didn't have to do any of it, but he chose to. And um, yeah, so um, we did, so the first Okay. We did get married early, like very early on. And that wasn't necessarily planned. Um, like looking back at it and just everything, I, I'm, I'm glad it happened the way it did. I would have still married him, but I probably would have waited until a little bit later on. The only reason we got married so early um, was because my dad was very sick and he wasn't going to be there long. So we was together for six months and decided we was going to get married. And wow. six yeah. months, that's it. Do yeah. you know how afraid I was to marry my husband? And I had been with him for damn near eight years and I was scared shitless to fucking yeah. sign them papers. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it was a scary situation and we knew each other our whole lives. So that made it a little different because it's like he wasn't a complete stranger, but we did rush it. And um, originally we was just going to do like a little court, court wedding situation just yeah. so that my dad could be there and walk me down the aisle and things like that. And then maybe have a ceremony later on. Um, but we ended up having a backyard wedding instead last minute. I mean, literally last minute through this wedding together, 70 people came like all this stuff and we got married and it was an amazing, like, like I said, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. Um, but you know, we didn't go on a honeymoon. We didn't, it was not traditional in the sense of like a traditional wedding. It was very like a shotgun wedding kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I didn't wear a dress. I just wore like a white skirt, white shirt and, um, all of this, <clears throat> And it was, but it was very special, very, very much something I'll hold cherish for the rest of my life. Um, but the thing is about it is, and it, we were doing so good. We was, we were doing so good. Like I said, I knew his, the only people I knew from his family really was his mom um, and his brother and his sister. His dad's side of the family, I had heard of them. I knew what his daddy was into and the stuff his daddy did, but he did not want me around that side of his family. He was very much ashamed of a lot of his family. And I, I think like we've talked about it now. I think he was worried that I wouldn't want to be with them, um, right. which wouldn't have been the case, but I think that's what he was worried about. And he was just embarrassed, I guess. But um my dad ended up, so I didn't know anyone, but his mom and his brother and his sister. And that is it. We got married so quick. And then um, after my dad passed away, we got married in June. My dad passed away at the end of September. Oh, so um, after my dad passed away, of course, that was very traumatic for me. And I, he literally died in my arms um, with just me and my mom there. I mean, and it happened so sudden and so quick. We, of course we knew it was going to happen and we had already like family had already came in, but that morning he was up walking, talking, like everything was fine. Five minutes before he died, everything was fine. And then it just happened so quick. Have you and, ever heard that this is that's what happens before they die. They get their they get this like burst of energy before they die. It's yeah. like their last hurrah. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It happened to my grandma too. I believe she, it. She was dying from cancer and my dad went to go take care of her until she died. And they get this I don't know I guess it's the last bit of their energy coming out of them before yeah. they go over to the other side, you know? Yeah. It's crazy because that's how he was he had already, he was already to the point where they were keeping him doped up with morphine yeah. 
And he was waking up just, he would sleep all the time. And when he would, would wake up, it was just cough, 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 cough. Because the cancer just spread everywhere. And he, at that point, was on chemo or nothing no more. So it was literally about keeping him comfortable. And I remember the nurse told us, like, I know you're going to want to give him food and water. You're going to think, like, he needs food, he needs water. But what he needs right now is to be as comfortable as possible and not in pain. So, cause we were trying to make him drink and make him eat and things like that. And they were like, his body does not need that right now. Um, but so that's how it had been for over a week. And he had been that death, you know, like deathly ill, but that day he had gotten up. He had like, talked to everybody, walked around, drank some, he got up and drank some coffee that morning, like all of these different things. And then within, like I said, a five minute span, he went to the restroom, walked himself to the restroom with his cane, was walking back <clears throat> and trying to catch his breath and was like, I can't breathe. So he sat down and we put his oxygen on him. And from there, it just all just like, happened so quick and you know my mom she's calling the hospice nurse calling family like I think he's dying like I don't know what's going on he can't breathe and he's sitting there with this oxygen on like grabbing at it you know because it's not helping him and I looked at him and I said do you want me to take it off and he said yes so I took it off of him and he calmed down a little bit and he laid back and I remember like rubbing his hair backwards or whatever. And I said, does, does that feel better? And he's like, yeah, that's a little bit better because he was like freaking out so bad. Yeah. And I remember rubbing his head back and I could see it was turning colors already. And he was just gasping for air. And when I seen that, I just, I stepped outside and started to cry. And then I felt guilty for being outside crying. So I went back in and I told him I loved him and, you know, and it just happened very quick from there. Um, and it was so many mixed emotions. Like I remember after the fact, I stood there and just watched him for like 10 minutes after he passed because your body goes through stuff. And I thought he was still alive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah. And I, and I wanted him to know I was there, you know? Yeah. Um, and my mama, she was, of course, all to, all to hell. So she had to be took away and all this stuff. And I just remember afterwards. And once I knew like he was really not there no more, I went outside and I would ju just scream and cry and then just punch my husband bless his heart, in the chest, just punch him and then grab him and hug him. And then put like, I was just the ear, like there was no consoling me. And I was so angry and mad and upset and confused and just all these things. So um, after that, however, I, you know, your brain can go, everyone deals with grief differently, but your brain can go through some crazy, your brain can do some crazy things to you. And <clears throat> after a day or two, I had tricked, my brain had tricked me into being like, I knew he wasn't there no more, but my brain had tricked me into like, he's going to be back. He's, he just went away. He's coming back. And I don't know if it was just a way to like, help me get through. Like I knew he wasn't there. I knew that. And I knew he was dead. I, I watched him die, but it's like my brain in my brain. It's like, Oh, he's, he's just on vacation. He's going to be back. This is just a bad dream. This is just a bad dream. And I made myself believe that up until literally his funeral. And I don't know, I was just so numb. Like I, I couldn't cry. I couldn't, I had no emotion. And I, I, it was very weird. It was very weird. I just felt nothing. Um, and then after a week or two, after we laid him to rest and all of that, um, it hit me. I woke up one morning and it just hit me like that. And I just went and laid on his bed and cried and cried. And after, you know, just trying to deal with that and try to be strong for my mom, because my mom was really bad. Like we had to get all the guns out of the house. We had to 
get all of his medicine out of the house. It was horrible. And I was watching her like a hawk because she was saying a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And that had me scared for her. And my dad had like one of the last things I promised him is that I would look after her and take care of her because he was really worried about what mama, how mama was going to be. And, um, and I tried, I really did. I tried really hard to, to be strong for her and to watch her and take care of her. And, you know, of course my husband as well, but I started really harping to my husband about, you need to try to have a relationship with your father. Like, I don't want you to regret not trying to have a relationship with your father. And um, he kept telling me, like, it's not a good idea. You don't understand. It's not a good idea. And I'm like, I, I get it. Like, I knew his dad was a drug dealer. And I, I knew all these things. He, he did things he shouldn't do, you know, in and out of prison, around a lot of stuff that we didn't need to be around. But in my head, it's like, none of that mattered. That is your dad. You need to try, at least try. And so um, I pushed it, which now in hindsight, I wish I hadn't ha hadn't have, but I pushed it, um, not really knowing the severity of the situation, even though he told me, I didn't know the severity of the situation. And then you know, the holidays came around Thanksgiving and all this. And I'm like, well, we're going to go to your dad's for Thanksgiving. I swear to you, we went there on a holiday on Thanksgiving and we ate all of that stuff. But literally right after eating, his dad disappeared. And I was like, where did your dad go? Where's he at? He's like, oh, he went out. He went out um, in the woods and they had like this abandoned trailer back down there. And like we went down there looking for him or whatever. And when we got to that house, my husband was like, I'll go in there. You stay, you stay out here. And I'm like, no, like, that's so stupid. Like if you're going to go, I'm going to go, you know? And he was in there and there was like all these people in there. There was no power, no nothing sitting around sh shaking a bottle. And, uh, yeah. And <laughs> I did not know what I was seeing. I didn't know what, like, I, I knew it was something, but I didn't know what. Yeah. And, um, you know, my husband's like, yeah, we're not going to, you don't need to be in there. You don't need to smell that. You don't, we don't need to be in there. And I was like, no, no, it's all good. Like I was curious. I didn't know what it was like all of these things. And my husband was like, no, no, but I'm stubborn. And I was like, well, here's to spend time with your daddy. Your daddy's down here. Well, I guess we're going to be down here. You know, it's Thanksgiving. And um, I quickly realized what the situation was or whatever. And I, I was automatically intrigued by it uh, just because I'd never seen it, didn't know anything about it. I could tell my husband was very uncomfortable, like, you know, about it all. And he just kept making comments about going back up to the house so after the we I've seen the whole process and mind you, uh, he's doing this in front of all these people, like just yeah. wide open. And this was the first time I ever met him. And I'm just like, this is normal. Just like some people like this is normal. And I was just intrigued by it. And then after the whole process, me and my husband walked back up and I'm just sitting there like trying to process all of this. Like, what did I just see? Like, what is going on? And his dad came up a few minutes later and we ended up smoking with them. And I remember when it passed around again, never seen anything like this. The worst I had done at this point was benzos. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like once or twice, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it passed around once and my husband hit it. And when he hit, I was like, well, if he hit it, I'm going to hit it. And I just remember my heart that first time my heart just like pumping out of my chest. And, um, and that was it. And then I was super happy, like on cloud nine, so happy, just 
it was the weirdest thing. It was just a major upper that yeah. first time. I never felt that again, never felt that again. Um, but that first time I literally felt my heart come out of my chest. And then I was just so happy talking 90 miles per hour, <laughs> to, like telling everybody I love them, wanting to hug everybody, like all of this stuff. And I was just on cloud nine. Couldn't go to bed that night. Couldn't nothing. But I remember, and I literally just hit it once. That's it. Just one time. Methamphetamine is no joke. It's powerful. It's no joke. It's no joke. But it's crazy because, you know, that was my first experience with it. And then, like I said, I tried to go to sleep. I felt my brain started to feel tired, but I couldn't go to sleep. And I was like, dang, I only hit it one time. Like, this is crazy. You know, why can I not go to sleep? And by seven, eight o'clock that morning, when the sun's coming up, I am so sick in the bathroom puking from one hit. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, so um, we ended up leaving. We we got up. My, my husband went to bed. Once he got up, we left. And they did ask us if we wanted to hit it again. And we both said no, um, because I already felt bad. Like, here I am. I'm sick as a dog. My husband didn't even want to be here. My husband begged me not to go in this house. You know, all of these things. And I pushed it and I pushed it and I pushed it. And he now looking at it, I know it's because he was scared. He was going to. He'd already lived. Yeah. You know, I didn't know anything about being an addict. I didn't know anything about substances like that, like nothing. So, you know, it, but that happened. And I remember like, I felt so bad for like a couple of days and um, I kept apologizing to him about it. But then there was that part of me that really wanted it too. And it was the craziest thing. Like I wanted to feel that feeling again. And I remember explaining it to my husband and being like, I just really like that feeling though. I wish like you could get that feeling from something because it was the, it was crazy one hit. And I'm just like on cloud nine. But, um, so we ended up like a couple days later, we ended up slipping up and doing it again and the same way smoking it. And it didn't give me that feeling. I never got that feeling again, but I chased it for two years. Um, and after that second time trying it, I did not stop. I did not stop. And I smoked every day for two years. Um, uh, honestly, a lot of that part of my life is very foggy. Like I remember bits and pieces of it. Um, you know, I remember knowing exactly how to make it everything every step that it took, you know, um, laughing at people, tweaking and freaking out and being up for days and like thinking that was funny and all of this. I was so stupid girl. I was like, I was that person who was inside the, we, we didn't do shake and bake. Like they were, we had, they were like, it was like a lab that we, I, I lived at with my friend in this trailer. Oh, the real deal. <laughs> I would have a fucking gemstone, crystal gemstone stuck into between my eyeballs and I'd be so high. People would be asking me, girl, what's she doing? And I'm like, you know, like I'm talking to my inner self. I'm in my third eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, we went to this and I'm not trying to, but this is kind of funny. Like I remember we pulled up one day at his daddy's house. We ended up moving in with his daddy. And at that point it was just, Oh no, <laughs> that could have not have been good. No, it was not. It was not good at all. Um, at all. But I remember we pulled up at his daddy's one day and there was this girl in the front door with binoculars looking across the road and we're walking in, like walking up the steps. We're like, what you doing? You know, and she's looking out the screen door with these binoculars. She says, you see those people up there in that tree and they're fucking with, they're like telling her, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're up there. All right. And she's like, there's like 11 of them in there. She's like, look, look. And there's nothing there, like nothing. And people would fuck with them, though. And people, like, you know, when when you're out there like that, it's funny. You're looking at it now, it's it's not. But at that time, that's what was funny to people. And But when we moved in with his dad was when it really, really got bad because it was such easy access. We did his running for him. He would give us stuff. 
and he would only give us so much that way we wasn't ever doing it and he knew and like all of this stuff but we were doing things a lot of things a lot of things we shouldn't have been doing um and it just got really really bad but the reason so that went on for two years and things started getting really heavy towards the two year mark there um, with his dad and his and his dad's girlfriend. And she had lost her child. D DSS had came in, took the baby. Um, and I won't never forget that day either because they showed up unannounced. And here we are like cleaning like crazy, throwing stuff on the truck, trying to get stuff out of there. Like, you know, it was wild. A child didn't need to be there. A child didn't need to be there. But, no, you know, no, at that not. time. I mean, imagine those fumes just from, even though it's the, you're, it's you're just coming out of the bottle and stuff, being around the yeah. lady. You know that in some houses where that's done at, like, even after it's already stopped, they, like, the people have moved out. People move in there and the stuff is in the walls. And oh, yeah. there's kids that were testing positive for methamphetamine mm -hmm. from it being, like, in the walls from when they were cooking in there. Oh yeah. I believe that because, and see, that's the thing. They would use that abandoned house all the time. Mm. But then I, I think everybody just got so bad out there that, you know, you push the envelope a little bit more, a little bit more. And that's like addiction in a nutshell. Like you do a little bit and then a little bit more, a little bit more things you never think you would do. Yeah. And before you know it, you're in the bathroom in the house you live in you know, battery pieces on the floor, you're walking around barefooted, you know, yeah. like just stupid stuff like that. And that's how bad it got. But um, so she got her, her child took away. And then his dad got popped hard. His dad got popped hard. And um, first the state picked him up. And of course, we're all like freaking out. We're all freaking out. And um, then Right after we got him out on bond, went through all this stuff to get him out on bond. And literally the day we got him out on bond and within a couple of days, it is so messed up the way that they did it. But but they turned it over to the feds. The feds picked it up. Yeah. And um, so we got him out. My mama put all of her land up to get him out. He gets out. And dang, um, three, three or four days later, they call him the the share the police office calls him and says hey your belongings are ready for you to come pick up your your truck your your all your stuff if you want to come pick it up and that's all he said to him so we take his girlfriend took him on down there and that's the understanding we had he was going to pick his stuff up and the feds were there waiting on him and they Damn. took his butt too and he ended up getting a lot of well I say a lot of 10 years to me is a lot of time. Yeah. You 10, know? You said 10? Yeah. yeah. Cause most so, of the time, you know, most of the time I think that like, I know most guys who have like a, their first offense for meth, it's like maybe five years they get, you know? So yeah. I mean, 10 years, that's a lot. Cause I know one of my friends was, uh, they were, he was offered 20 on a habitual offender uh, case, you know? And that's, yeah. And that's after they dropped it because they were first talking like he was going to get 21. Yeah. And then it dropped, you know, and his bond was there was it, it was ridiculous. Like there was just no way he, he was getting out. There was no way. And so he ended up going to Fed time and um, come to find out, like a lot of those people had written statements on him. His friend, his girlfriend, his girlfriend had written statements on him. His girlfriend had written statements on all of his kids, me, his like had written statements on everybody so that she wouldn't get in trouble. His yep. best friend had written statements on us. So we had two statements against us and we had people saying to us too, that all oh, you get one more, you're gone. You're gone. If you get one more, you're out of here. And I started freaking out. I've never been to jail ever. And my husband had never really been in jail, like never overnight, nothing like that. Yeah. So we ended up leaving and going to Florida and staying with to just to get away, just to get away and to try to get cleaned out. Because when you're on meth, you're all, like, that's already a scary situation. But when you're on meth, it's even you're even more paranoid. And yep. it's like we had no option. Like, you got to go. We got to get out of here. They're they're watching us. They're looking for us. And, you know, we really just made ourselves believe that because, I mean, dang, you know, there was a lot going on. So we ended up leaving. 
and going to Florida for a week and staying with my sperm donor. And he was drunker than Cooter Brown the whole time. It was so ridiculous. But uh, and getting in bar fight, like it wasn't much. I, I can't say much better. Like if we can't really weigh it, but because I was still drinking and stuff, but I was getting away from the mess, mess yeah. which was a huge problem for me at the time. And um, so that happened. We stayed there for like a week or so. And I will, I'll be honest, like the worst part about coming off meth for me was just no energy. I didn't have much energy, but other than that, it really wasn't that bad. I, yeah, I wasn't there's not a bunch of physical withdrawal to it. A lot of people like try to say that it's not so much a phys it's not physical withdrawal. Like you feel like shit, you're tired. You yeah. might be a little achy because when you were high, you were like running all over the place and doing all kinds of shit. But it's mostly psychological. It's mostly yes. in your mind withdrawal, you know? Oh, yeah. That was the worst part for me was, well, honestly, with all of everything I've ever dealt with, it's been mental. The mental part has been the hardest part for me. Um, but so we got we got cleaned up and dried out and we ended up going back to North Carolina and going and staying with my mom and starting over, like just starting over. Because, I mean, two years went by so quick. It's crazy how quickly it goes by in that world. And then it's just gone, you know. But you don't really get that time back. And so it didn't feel like two years, but it had been two years. So when we came back, we was doing good. At, like I said, this whole time I still smoked. I, I always smoked cannabis up until my mid-20s. Um, so I always smoked cannabis and I would still rec recreationally drink. But I will say after I got off meth is when I started drinking heavier because I always was trading one thing for another or one thing yeah. for another. Um, so but shortly after coming back, after a couple of months is when I found out I was pregnant with my firstborn, my son. And that was, that was it. You know, I was so grateful that I had got off meth. I found out very early too. I was only six weeks pregnant. Um, so that was good. And I, and I wasn't doing anything um, other than smoking cannabis. And, and gradually I, I stopped doing that as well. As I got further along, I just kind of weaned myself down on that. Um, but and when, of course, when he was born, like literally he was, he was perfect, but, um, I had a lot of complications throughout that pregnancy, like just like everything you could think of. It just felt like everything you could think of was going wrong in that pregnancy. I had preeclampsia, um, I had the, uh, gestational diabetes that they had to keep watch of. I was, I had to go to a high risk doctor and all of these things. And then I ended up going into labor um, six week, six weeks early. No, I, I was exactly 37 weeks when I went into labor. And so that's seven, eight, nine, two, what, four weeks early. And um, they tried to stop it. They couldn't stop it. So, but I was only out of two centimeters, but they, but it, they couldn't stop it. Um, so they ended up having to induce me and all of this stuff. And I, when, when it came time, like I had this whole birthing plan. I was like, I don't, I want to do everything naturally. I don't want no medicine. This is the way I want it done. No matter what, no matter what. And that was my plan. Well, <laughs> when the time came and I got to 16 um, centimeters, I was dying. I, I wasn't like, screaming crying but I was you definitely heard me and I was like okay yeah I have I need that epidural I need that epidural so they gave me the epidural and in my body like they say it can happen one of two ways either it takes too good or some people complain that it don't take good enough well mine took real good real real good and I couldn't feel anything from below my titties down to my toes that's how mine was. I couldn't feel anything either at all. Oh, it was bad. It was so <laughs> bad. So when they when it got to the point of them saying it was time to push and everything, I'm sitting there like pushing with everything I got. 
and they said, push with your butt. I will never forget this. They was like, you're not, you're not pushing with your butt. You need to push with your butt, push with your butt. And I said, I can't feel my butt yeah. because I couldn't feel my butt. And I pushed so hard that I literally busted a, like a vessel in my eye. Um, but he wasn't coming. Every time they would see his head coming out, I would have to take a breath and he'd go back in. So they ended up having to do an emergency C-section. And that was scary because his oxygen was dropping. I could hear his heartbeat like going crazy. The, the doctors and the nurses were screaming at each other. And they was like, we got to take you back right now. We got to get him out now. And, you know, it, that's another thing that happened real quickly. They had me on oxygen, all of this stuff. And they're wheeling me through. And my, they was like, my, your husband cannot go. He has to stay in here. Nobody can go back there. Um, and they told me they was going to have to put me to sleep because they did not even have time for the medicine to like hit me to cut. They needed to cut me open like right then. So I'm going back there, not even being able to really say bye to my husband or nothing, not under like really understanding what's going on. They're slamming me through the doors, just screaming at each other. It was very traumatic. And they push me over onto the um, bed and they're explaining to me that they're going to give me stuff to put me to sleep. And I remember grabbing that the nurse by the hand while they're explaining this to me. And I said, just promise me if it comes down to it and you have to like choose me or that, or my baby, please, please save my baby. I don't care what it takes. Please save my baby. And I was put to sleep and that was the scariest thing in the world. Because when I woke up, I didn't see my baby anywhere. I didn't hear my baby crying. I didn't know what happened to my baby. And, you know, when you first wake up from being asleep, like everything's blurry. It takes you a minute to see stuff. So, but that was the first thing I asked before I could even see. All I seen was light and just fuzziness. I was like, where's my child? Because I could hear people. And they said he was okay. He was with daddy, which was great. So after recovery, we go back there and I, I finally get to hold him. And they did say like he, when he was born, he was not breathing and they had to bag him for 15 minutes before he took his first breath. But because he had never took a breath before of, of oxygen, he was fine. They said if he had even took a tiny breath, he would have been br like brain dead, no, no brain activity. Um, so that was a miracle. And I'm sitting there holding him and he's so tiny because he's, you know, early. Why do you and think he has so many complications? What was, what, why, well, why? Come to find out weeks, like months later, it was because there was an infection in my placenta. They sent it off and it came back saying, but they didn't tell me what it was. They just mm -hmm. said that there was an infection that had caused me to go into labor. Um, okay. But so I'm sitting there holding him and I swear, again, it's like, it just all happened so quick. Again, they come in there. They said that I was starting to turn yellow and they had to put me on um, magnesium so that I wouldn't start having seizures. And it was just all this stuff happening. Um, and they told me that um, something something wasn't right with, with my liver enzymes and something was not right. So they was doing all these tests. Come to find out I had gallbladder, uh, gallstones. And they were not in the right place. Like they were in a duct they weren't supposed to be in. Um, and they said it was very serious to get it out. But it was a surgery that was so precise that you had to be so precise about it that that place was not like educated enough to do it. So then they had to transfer me with a newborn baby just had a C-section to a bigger hospital <laughs> to go through all of that. Um, and long story short, just just to, so I'm not spending too much time on this part. Um, it took a total of three to four months before I was able to hold my son by myself between, I had four different procedures done. They had to do a laparoscopic, laparoscopic um, procedure to get the gallstones out of the place that they weren't supposed to be in. Then they had to do it to get the other ones out. Then after I recouped from my C-section and those two surgeries, they went, went ahead and took my gallbladder out um, because I was super sick, like puking and, and stuff all the time. 
So it was, it was a lot and it took me a couple of months to recover. And my son was four or five months old before I actually got to hold him and walk around with him by myself. And Damn. of course, along with all of this craziness, they put me on pain medication. Oh, so yeah. that, that was a, um, you know, that was the beginning of that. And they had me on perk tens. I'll never forget it. And I, I was abusing them very quickly. I started abusing them and taking more than I should have. But what I will say is I really was in a lot of pain at that time. One and two, the doctor was giving them to me like candy, like candy. They would give me like 60 a week. And then every, like I would call them and tell them like, I need more. And he wouldn't ask questions, wouldn't not, would just give them to me. Just give Back them then, to it me. It was like that. It yeah. Was like that. And yeah. I thought it was the craziest thing because, and then of course my, my husband started using them as well. And I started sharing with him. So it just started this whirlwind with that. And, um, you know, at the time I was like, I'm not doing anything wrong. These are prescribed to me. I need them. I'm in pain you know, all of this stuff, it's, it's helping me be able to function. But then, um, after like, they had me on them for, I don't know, probably a, it was a while, six months, maybe longer. And then no, no questions, no nothing. They just took them. Like they just took them. One time I called and said, Hey, can you refill these? And they said, no, I think they did give me maybe like 15 or something like that, but that was it. And then after that, there was no more. There's like, we can do this, but after this, we won't be able to do anymore. And I seen that, like, I seen it coming, but I didn't at the same time because they were feeling them like no problem and yeah. hadn't said anything about taking me off of them. But I mean, common sense tells you you're not supposed to be on them forever. But at that point, I had just really gotten to where that became a big part of my routine was taking that medicine to, to function. And I don't know, I don't know if it was real or if it was in my head, but I felt like I needed it or I was in pain. And so when they took me off of them is when I started buying them off the streets and that got costly very quickly. And that, also escalated very quickly. Um, so we were, I was getting like Roxy thirties and that's all I would do. I was very picky. And one day we could not get them. They just were not around anywhere. And um, my husband's cousin was like, Hey, you know, I can get you something that is way better, way cheaper. And it's going to keep you high way longer. And I was like, bullshit like that don't even sound realistic you know and he's like I'm serious man I'm serious and he didn't tell us what it was he didn't whatever I had been like running that whole day we had been looking for something you know and it was just so like so he just went and got it and it was something I don't know if you've ever heard of these but they're called opanas okay oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, so he had an Opana 20 and I was like, oh, okay, cool. And he's like, it's, it's a pain, pain medicine. It's an opiate. I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. And he's like, but the, the thing is, is you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do it via IV. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? Like it waits till he gets it brings it, shows it to me and says, Oh, here it is. Oh, but this is the only way you can do it. And, um, again, I didn't know anything about that life, but, and I did not have this, this first go around, I did not have my son with, with me. He was with my mom. Um, but anyways, so I, I was scared. My husband went first. He had used before in his past way before me. And so he was no like stranger to that life. And, I watched him first because I was scared. And then afterwards I, I went and it, 
dropped me to my knees. I mean, dropped me to my knees. And um, I remember I, I was so scared that I made him squirt half of it out because of the way my husband reacted. Because right. when he done it, he grabbed his chest and was like, got red. His neck was red all over. Like, it was scary. And I'm like, yeah. are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And he couldn't talk to me. So I was like, take, take some of that out, please. Like, I don't want that to happen to me. And it still happened, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's always it was, scary your first time shooting up with any oh, drug. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I bet, I bet so. See, and that's the thing is I was so picky, but um, that was all I would was Opanas or Roxy's. I never shot up meth. I never shot up, not that it makes it any better by no means. I was just very... Even in my addiction, I was such a worry wart. And so I don't know. I was just always being an overthinker. It's like, oh, no, I can't do this. Like, it's any better, <laughs> you know? But what happens is, days, like, that's how I was at first, too. But then I was around people who were shooting meth all the time. I would say, oh, I will never do that. No yeah. way. I'm scared to do that. But after a while of seeing them do it, it wears on you. And it you does. see them coming out of the back bedroom and they look triple high than I was. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, why are they so much higher than me? That's not, that's not fucking fair. Yeah. So one day I finally just said, Ugh, just give it to me. Just do it to me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I do know. And and that's with, uh, with meth, mostly I just smoked. I did snort it a few times, but it just hurt too bad for me. Um, and I did like a, a couple of hot rails, but that was the worst. This, you know, was, there was no, there was no, nothing compared to this. Um, and it was the hardest thing I ever overcame in my life, in my life. Um, and I, and I, it did, it made me do a lot of things that I am not proud of. Um, and it's, it's hard to talk about because I, you know, I'm not, I think I look back at that person and the person who did all of these things when I was via IV user and, and all this, and it had gotten to the point, my tolerance got built up really quick. So between me and my husband, we were shooting two Opana 40s a piece a day and they costed a lot of money. So we were spending like hundreds of dollars a day just to get high. And, you know, his little job wasn't enough. Mine wasn't. So then we're, we started hauling, like just doing any, whatever we could do to get money, taking stuff to the pawn shop, taking yep. stuff to my mama, things that I would never do, things that I literally, and I always had the intentions in getting it back. And I remember I would, I would say that, like, we got to get this back. You promise we'll get this back. And I had those intentions. I had every intentions. Yeah, but, I, I know how you feel. Don't be ashamed. I know yeah. that it's kind of like, hard to talk about because you're like I wasn't I'm not that way anymore but like we've all been through that I did the same thing girl I I pawned stuff that was so important to my mama and never got it back you know what yeah. I mean I pawned like my grandma's my grandma that died that gave my mom this ring and that like it was horrible st stuff you know and I, yeah. I wanted to get it back I even made little sticky notes to remind me to yeah. go and pay the pawn shop on Friday yeah, and I still lost it, you know. So don't be ashamed. We've all done, we've all been there. Yeah, and I know, and I think that that's been the hardest part in recovery is that part of it because that happened, and it was my mom. I knew she would love me no matter what, you know. And I think, and I, it wasn't like I was stealing from everybody, but I did. I, I would I would take from her, and because I knew I could get away with it. And she didn't know, like she believed me when she would ask me when she knew something was wrong. She knew something was off, but I was doing a really good job. I thought <laughs> at keeping it together on the surface. If you didn't know, you didn't know I was taking care of my baby. I wasn't having my baby around it. I wasn't like taking my baby to do things like that. My baby had the diapers food, th this, like, you know what I mean? And, and it validated my addiction. Cause it's like, Oh, you can do this you're doing just fine. It's not affecting nobody. And it was even the pawn shop situation. It's like, you're going to get that back. It's not a big deal. You're not doing nothing wrong. And then my husband lost his job. And when he lost his job, Oh God, 
that's that is when it really got the worst because we had to have money. We had to be high. Like in our head, it was survival mode. Yeah, and you sick if you don't have those Roxies. Yeah, you know? and and Opana is like, oh, they're like around here where I'm from. They were like the strongest medicine, like mm -hmm. pain medicine you can get, and my tolerance was so built up. It was so bad. And we were spending, I mean, they were going for ridiculous amounts of money. How much were y'all paying for the Roxy thirties? We were paying, I was paying $30 a Roxy. They got the up to 45. Down. They got up to 45 around here. Oh, and wow, the, yeah. the Opana is like for a 10 milligram or 20 milligram. When I first started, you get a 10 milligram for like 15, 20 bucks. But it got so bad that they went up on everything. So a 10 milligram was 30 bucks, you know, and then it just went up from there. It was crazy. Um, so it got very costly. And to get the 40 milligrams, we were we were paying $80 a piece. Yep. And I needed two a day. He needed two a day. That's a lot of money. Yep. Um, so we started hauling scrap and doing all this stuff like odd in jobs, landscape, whatever we could do to like make a little bit of money so that we could get by every day. And it just wasn't enough to, to feed our habit. Plus take care of our child, you know, financially um, and all of this. So we ended up, I'll never, I, we ended up literally junking a perfectly good vehicle, perfectly good vehicle because we had no money. And it was the only way we could have money. And we got like 200 bucks out of it. Like it got to that point. It just got that bad where I remember there were so many times that I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired of this life. I hated myself. Like I had such a self-loathing for myself that it's crazy. And um, I would throw my my stickers, my things away and then throw it all away and say, I don't ever want to do this again. I don't ever want it around no more. Like I, I can't do this. And by the next damn morning, I'm digging in that trash can trying to find it. And, um, we, it just got so bad. We were starting to bounce checks, every, just everything. I remember going and opening up a whole bank account just so that I could get checks. You know what I mean? And it's like, you don't rationalize these things in your head. You're just doing it, just doing it, just doing it. And people were giving me these thoughts too. Cause I didn't know any, like, they're like, Hey, you can do this and you can do that. And yeah, they teach you the, the tricks of the trade. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. My husband, when I met him, we did the same thing with his bank account. Cause he was in such good standing with his bank. We would get it down and then we would overdraft it and they would cover our overdrafts. Yep. You yep. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So we would do that over and over and over again. One time my sister caught me shooting up in the bathroom. She grabbed my rig, took it outside, threw it in one of those big ass green fucking dumpsters. Bitch, mm -hmm. my ass climbed the dumpster and dove head it head first yeah. into that dumpster to go yeah. get my rig. The the worst that it for me, because I like I said, I live in the sticks. <laughs> or I lived in the sticks. So we had like this big huge cliff. And I remember throwing it over that cliff where there's nothing but trash. I mean, just trash where people just threw their trash off of yeah, it. Yeah, like a dumping site. Yes. And then the next day we got something and I was like, oh, my God. Like, I literally walked, like, held on to a freaking vine and, and, and like, lowered yourself down there. Yes, girl. And then, and then bleached it out, all this stuff. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy the things we'll do, you know? And. And it did. It got to that point. And the the um, store that I was cashing these bad checks at was a store that knew me my whole life, which kind of thank God, like, oh, just thank God. I, I'm very lucky because um, they knew me my whole life and they everyone around me could see that I was something wasn't right. And I was lying to everybody. And it started, those checks started to bounce and they was telling me and I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll bring you the money Friday. I'll bring you the money Friday. Then I wouldn't come. Then I wouldn't come. And then my mom, she's like starting to ask, where's this at? Where's that at? Oh, uh, so-and-so is fixing it. It'll be here Friday. It'll be here Friday. And that caught up with me. And that's, that web of lies just really caught up with me. And I remember we was over at my husband's um, 
grandma's house and my mama pulled in. She had got off the phone with one of my dear, got off the phone with one of my dear friends and asked them just straight up, like, you need to tell me what is going on with my daughter. If you know what's going on with my daughter, you need to tell me. And she told her everything. And so my mom showed up over there and we, re we really weren't doing anything wrong there. We were really just at his grandma's, but we would have ended up going and getting something or something. And I remember my mom had pulled in and she didn't knock on that door. She did nothing. She barreled in and she said, I know, I know what you've been doing and you've got two choices. Either you come with me right now or um, you're not going to like the second choice. I can promise you that. And I was like, you know, instantly started crying or whatever. And she's like, I'm, this is it. She's like this, you know, I don't know to the extent, but I need to hear it from you. I need to hear from you what's going on. And so I went and I remember looking at my husband because my husband wasn't going to go. He's like, I don't got to listen to the shit, blah, blah, blah. And I, I remember just giving him a look and he knew I was going to go. Like I was just so done. I was so done lying. I was so, I'm a horrible liar. I'm a horrible liar. And I had done it for so long and I was just so tired and so exhausted and felt awful and everything's like, you know, you're stressed out about everything, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm tired. I was tired of waking up doing all this shit that I didn't even want to do just to get high for five minutes and still be miserable, you know? So I looked at him. I said, I'm going. And he did not get up. And I, I told him, I was like, um, I got the baby or whatever. And I walked out and I'm just bawling. Cause I was like, he's not going to come with me. He's not going to come. And I got in the car to get the baby situated and everything. And, my mama starts to pull out and I said, just give him a minute. Just give him like just one more minute. And he, he did like right when we was about to pull out, he came out and got in the car with us and he knew, like he knew that meant like that was, that was the beginning for us, you know, yeah. um, of trying to get clean and all of this stuff. And it was a, it was a long uphill battle because originally me and him both were going to go to a detox facility and, and do that for seven days. And then, you know, depending on where we was either go to rehab or, or whatever. Um, so we had to go get medically cleared, do all of that stuff. We both got medically cleared, but they wouldn't take both of us because mm -hmm. we were married. Yep. Um, and I think that's fucked up. I think that they should allow people who are married to go into treatment together. Honestly, yeah. me and my husband, we got sober together. And a lot of people that are married get sober together. And it's helpful to be able to go in there yes. and not have to worry about your significant yes. other being out there running the streets. Nowadays, there's treatment centers that actually allow you, if you're a couple, to come in, which I think is awesome, honestly. Yeah, that's amazing. because, And I think another thing is, um, and I've thought about opening up and talking about this more on my second channel, because like state funded places are just like, cause I had Medicaid. Mm -hmm, so yeah. the facility that covered what I had insurance wise, was, it was shit. It was a yeah. horrible place and they did not give it. They did not care about us. It's like, it's a resource only because they had to have that resource. They right, really they had to be there. The counselors that are there are underpaid. They're overworked. They have like so many staff. They have so many clients on their a client load that they're like, yeah, they, they've lost their. It's like to me to work in to work helping people in recovery. You got to have the passion for it. You got to yes. be on fire to get people excited about their recovery and excited about wanting to change their life. If Absolutely. you lost that and you're still doing it and you're miserable, you need to get out of the fucking uh, get I out do. of the treatment industry and, and stop doing that because I you do. end up hurting people. Yeah, I, and another thing is like the place where I went because so so we we talked about it. And um, my husband was like, well, 
you need to go because he really is like mentally a very strong-willed person. And if he wants to do something, he can do it. You know what I mean? Um, he's done it before. He did it before. And he made it look so easy when he did it before. Um, and it was a choice he made completely on his own. So he's like, I am good. I'll be fine. But I'm, I'm worried that you won't be because I had already tried to stop so many times while I was out and I was so dead set. Like I, it, it would be that night and I'd say I'm done. And I felt so much better just saying it and like putting it out there. And I'm like, I'm done. Like this is it. And the next morning before I even had like got up out the bed and done something, you know what I mean? It was like, I can't do this. I can't, I, I can't do this. Um, so I knew like mentally, I just, I was not in a good place. So I went and, um, they, it was, it was, that was a, it was a crazy experience. That was traumatic. They had the girls and the, and the guys together. So there was a lot of stuff happening that shouldn't have been happening. Yeah, that's not a good um, idea to me either. I feel like it should be no co-ed because when you put guys and girls together then you got the girls that are like attention seeking and look yeah. like there's just the, you know when i went to treatment and i was in a co-ed situation my best friend was the gay guy i wasn't trying to get with no boys i was yeah. trying to like just get out of there you know what i'm saying but then there was times where i was in my little hoe phase and i had like four boyfriends by the time i left treatment you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah and see and that that was the thing was like they tried to pair you because so they had the girls on one side and the guys on the other, but you did everything. The hallway was like this. It was like a U shape. And then the main office is right in the front. And then they had like a the room, like well, what like the rec room and then the little cafeteria and the TV room or whatever. So <sighs> Uh, when I got there, I signed myself in voluntarily, did everything I needed to do. They took all of my stuff from me. They put it in the locker. They wouldn't even let me, my mom and them had bought me like dum-dums and gum and all of this stuff. They wouldn't let me have none of it. They locked it all up and was like, nope, you can't take it. And I'm like, you suckers? Like what? Why? Like, I don't understand. And then uh, the one thing they did let us have was cigarettes though. And if you didn't have cigarettes, they provided cigarettes. It, it was palm oils, but still, you know, like that, that was cool. <laughs> so, um, but they still kept them too. They would only give you one each time you go out or whatever. So they go through all your stuff, put everything you can't have in a locker and gave me my bag of stuff, took me to this room. And for the first day I was there in that room by myself. And um, it was, of course, I was anxious. I was uh, everything. I was every emotion. I was, I missed my baby. I'd never been away from my child that long. Um, I missed my husband. It was very lonely, you know, but I was okay. And that night, they did vitals in the morning and in the evenings. And that night, they gave me a handful of medications. Don't know, couldn't tell you what none of them were. They didn't tell me what none of them were, like literally did not tell me what none of them were, but they had asked me like a slew of questions and like checked it off and gave me all these medicines accordingly. And it was a handful of stuff. And I remember they gave them to it to us at 930 by 945. I'm trying to walk to my room. My legs were so heavy. My head, I couldn't hold my head up. I was like this, trying to make it to my bed. And I just remember just falling like this and I don't remember nothing else on my onto the bed and just waking up the next day do it again and it was like literally a common I had never been that messed up out in the streets and they had me messed up you know and Back there in the was, day they used to do that they used to give you trazodone gabapentin seroquil yes, that's what it was these, all yeah. of that together combined and I know there was uh gabapentin and Seroquel for sure and there yeah. was one or two more things all at one time and it was the craziest thing um then you would wake up just feeling like blah and like you were drunk still from the night before like a hangover yes. and yeah. if you didn't get up at this place if you didn't get up at six o'clock for vitals you everybody would be punished and wouldn't be able to go outside and smoke so oh, yeah you made sure everybody got up, you know, you made sure of it. And um, so the first two days it was kind of like that. And then 
on the, the third night or the third day, they brought another woman in who was my age and she was coming off heroin. And they do try to pair you with people that you can relate to, to some extent, you know, and that's what they did. They, she was, they paired her with me because she had just, she had a little baby boy. She was coming off heroin and Opana is like a synthetic form of heroin. And there was just a lot of different like similarities like that. So they put us together and this bless this girl's heart. She was, it was awful. She was coming off like very, very much coming off of um, heroin and like it was like an exorcism she was laying on that bed that night and just screaming in pain and agony and jumping jumping up off that bed and tossing and turning sweating and I, I kept trying to talk to her to see if I could help her in some way and she wouldn't she couldn't speak to me and so finally the next morning when it's still happening and I hadn't slept all night I went up to the front desk and I was like can like I have some earplugs or something. So I tried that. Um, next night, same thing. Couldn't get her up for vitals. Everybody got punished for it. And they're telling me like, that's your bunkie, man. Get her up, get her out of that bed. Get her. And I was like, well, she just got here. Like I, when I first got there, I slept a lot that first day. You know what I mean? Like give her a minute. And that second day she did get out of the bed for a few minutes, talked a little bit, but she was just really, really going through it. And she was so, I won't ever forget it. She was so itty bitty tiny. And hearing those, hearing her scream all night and jumping off, like I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I asked them if, um, like I was bawling for her, you know, and I couldn't help her. I couldn't sleep. It made me miss, like, it just made me, I don't know. It just made me really emotional. And so I asked them if they could switch my rooms and they said, no, that they couldn't switch my room. I was just going to have to deal with it. And it was just starting to pile up by day three of me being in there. My emotions were off the, off the roof you know, this girl in this situation happening and having to deal with that, not sleeping, missing my baby, missing my family, not being away from them that long ever in my life. And I just remember calling my husband. You only got 15 minutes on the phone and I'm crying. I'm like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. So I went to go sign myself out and I told him, I said, I, I, I'm i ready to go. Like, <laughs> I, I want to leave. And they said, well, okay, sign this form um, just so you know. And it was a form letting me know that if they seem fit, they could hold me for up to 72 hours. And I, I was like, whoa, but I signed myself in. Like, I can't just sign myself out. <laughs> and they said, well, if we think that you're a danger to yourself or that you need to be here, we can hold you up. It's for your protection and for others and da, da, da. And I was like, okay. And panic starts sell setting in because I'm like, they're going to let me out this bitch, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and so they made me see this like therapist, counselor person. And I just remember I was very emotional. I was very honest about how I was feeling. I've been very honest about how I was feeling in vitals, everything. And she evaluated all that. And she said, I think you need to be here. She's like, I know you missed your baby. And I know you missed this, but I think you need to be here. And I was like, oh, no, but I'm telling you, I'm ready to go. Like, I want to go. And she was not having it. So they held me for 72 hours. And or they held me for 48. And she said she was going to talk to me again after two days and see where I was. And I remember just crying and crying, crying. And some of the people that were in there had been in there. Uh, like that was like their sixth, eighth, ninth time being in there. So they knew how things worked in there. And I started asking around and I was like, how the fuck do I get out of here? I need to get out of here. I was panicking. Like I did at that point, it was like, screw my, like screw everything. I got to get out of here. They're not letting me out. And they started telling me like, when they ask you at vital time, how you're feeling, you tell them you're fine. Tell them you're good. Don't say anything's hurting you. Anything's like just a bunch of line. Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm great. Everything's great. And that's what I did. And I did that for like a whole day. And then the next day when the, um, 
lady took me back in there. I put it on a fake, a fake act, acted like I was fine, feeling so much better. Lied, I lied, straight lied, so that they let me out of there. And they did after 48 hours, let me out. And I was just so, I, I won't never forget it because up until that third day, my head was really in the game. I really wanted to do better. And then when they wouldn't let me leave, panic set in. And I no longer, I just wanted to get out of there. And it was yeah, not I don't like that. I don't like, see, wherever the treatment centers that I've always been to, you could you could leave at your own volition. Like yeah. nobody can hold you there against your will. You must have been at like like a place where like a like a hospital kind of setting. Well, it was like I, it used to be. It used to be a schoolhouse actually, and they had transverted it into this facility, mm. and it was um, but it was there were people. I there was a lot of things about it that was. Like some people that were there needed to be in other facilities. Like they had, and stuff. Yes. Yes. Okay. And it was very difficult. Just like the way they had us all piled in there like that. And yeah. it was like, I don't belong here is how it felt. Yeah. And then them not letting me leave was just the cherry on top. So up until that point, I was really, really, my head was really in it. But then I just went into panic mode and was trying to get out of there. And once I got out or whatever, all I could think of was using. Like that was all I could think of. And of course, I wanted to see my family and I wanted to love on my, my baby and get home. But that's all I thought about. And um, so I, I quickly relapsed from that situation. And it was it was off. Like, but what I will say is, not that it makes it better, but I, but I did stop, um, using via IV. So I was like, oh, well, I'm not doing that anymore. And, um, I wasn't using as much. Good. So That's I was good. validating it in that way. And that went on for uh, several months. And, um, I found out I was pregnant with my second child. And that is like what really got me into, um, MAT. Uh, so at first I was like scared to say anything, scared to tell my baby doctor, scared to anything. And I was just trying to do it on my own and like get right. off. And I was really struggling with that. So after a couple of months, someone had told me I wasn't being honest with my baby doctor. So I'm sure they would have told me if I had been, but, um, some somebody told me that you know if you try to come off of this stuff cold turkey it can kill your child and yeah, I was absolutely. like wait what I was like so that scared me you know because there were I was going days where I wouldn't do anything at all and then I would feel really really bad and do something I was trying not to but then I would right and I felt so horrible about myself because I knew this baby was in me um, and that this living being was inside of me. And it's like, I got to do right by this little baby. And um, so after a couple of months, I finally did break down and go to a maintenance medication facility. And I won't I'll never forget it. It was January, 2016. And it changed my life. It really changed my life. Um, and then I, I stayed at that facility for oh, over three years. And they had like counseling and stuff in there too. and would help me with other resources. If I needed other kinds of resources, anything I needed help with, they were just so amazing. And it was like a one of those situations where you had to kind of build your trust up with the facility. So you had to go every day for so long and then, you know, which yeah. really helped me in the beginning because I needed that. I needed that structure and I needed that keeping me in check and that accountability because I, I, I wasn't holding myself accountable and I wasn't able to give myself that structure. So they really helped me put those steps and implement those steps into place. And so I was there for a couple, two years. And once I was stable and doing really good, um, 
I ended up going to a monthly facility and stop going there because it was starting to get to like, okay, like this is a lot, this is a lot of hassle, you know? So I did that and it, it was really, it was a really good experience for me. Um, the hardest I, there was one, one time where, um, I relapsed once I did get in there or into a facility, but it was just one, that was my one slip up and, that was it. And I was quickly back on track. And then once I started going to the monthly facility, they had me, the only thing though, is I was on the highest milligram of Subutex you could be on for three years and, or right at three years. And they weren't like weaning me off of it or anything, but like I was so ready and wanted to come off of it and wanted to just be able to live life without being on it. Um, and, but they were like, in the beginning, after I had my daughter, they were like, well, you need to wait because you just had a baby. That's a lot on you. You don't need to do that yet. And then after like six months or so, they started weaning me down and they did something called, we tried it the regular way. And mentally it was just, I would always stop. I would always stop at like 16 and not want to go down anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they gave me an option for a blind taper, which really worked really good for me because I didn't know how much they were taking. I love and, blind tapering. I think it's the best way to go. Yeah, me too, because it's like not knowing really helped me. It really helped yeah. me a lot. And I was on like four milligrams for the longest time and didn't know that. And then got down to two milligrams they, when I got down to two milligrams, that's when they told me they weren't telling me the whole time where I was at. But when I got down to two milligrams, they let me know. And I was so proud of myself because I was like, Oh my God, you know, I had tried to do that for a year and I kept yeah. not being able to do it. And then I was finally able to do it, you know? Um, so a blind taper really worked amazingly for me. And as of now, and my husband, shortly after I started going, my husband went like literally a couple months after. Um, so that was really, really good. And we worked and we've been in our recovery together the whole time. He's not had any relapse, which I'm really proud of him. And um, that's been such a, a a good thing for me too, because it helps to hold you accountable. Seeing him do good makes me want to do good type of thing. And um, he's always just been so much more, I don't even know if it's more strong willed. It's just, I don't know. I always struggled with things more than he did mentally, you know? Um, so seeing him do good really helped me. And then just being able to do that together. And then, like I said, we've got almost eight years under our belt now where we have not had any, subs you know, any substances. I don't even, I don't smoke cannabis anymore. I stopped smoking. When I started going to the um, MAT place, I, I had to stop smoking because of that, that it's not legal where I'm at. So they wouldn't let us, wouldn't let us, or you couldn't have it in your system. And I was willing to put it down so that I could, you know, but um, yeah, and things have been good. What I will say is last year I did, um, and this is why the Jessica Kent stuff really bothered me because last year um, there was a lot of different things that had happened in my life. And when I say I quit everything, I mean everything. I stopped drinking, not even recreationally. I didn't smoke cannabis, like nothing, nothing. And I've done so good and I've been so proud of myself. But last year I started drinking recreationally again a little bit mm -hmm. and going just when I was out with my friends, girlfriends, which is very seldom. I got three kids now. And yeah. so it wasn't like that much, but I was. And then I was starting to buy, it went from drinking with the girls to buying wine to bring home to going through a bottle a week. And Thankfully, I, I caught it quickly um, because it's like I said, it started off with one bottle that would last me a whole week. And then I was down in a whole bottle in a day. 
That's uh, how quickly it goes. And that's why it's so important for us to not sit here and like, it's like not okay. Like if we're in recovery and we're out like getting fucking drunk and stuff, like that's dangerous. Oh yeah. It's dangerous to share that with people online Absolutely. and give them an idea like it's not that big of a deal because it can oh, be yeah. a huge deal for somebody else. Oh. You know? And the craziest part about it, not that Jessica has anything, but her video that uh, when that happened, I was going through it almost simultaneously. Yeah. So it's like, he, he, oh, well, she's doing it. So it's not that bad. Yeah. And it was crazy because when she made her first video, I hadn't shared public. I hadn't not that I was dealing with this very much secretly. My husband didn't even know I was struggling like that. Like he knew I would drink a glass of wine when I made supper, but he didn't know. Yeah. And I watched Jessica's video and that's kind of what made me like break, like realize like, oh my God, like you're, you're struggling girl. You know what I mean? Um, and then, like I said, that, that one, there was one day where I went through a whole bottle of wine before supper time and I was blitzed by the time my husband got home from work and I, I just felt like shit about myself. I felt so awful that I had, cause I don't drink around my kids. I always would like, you know, and it just got to the point where I was drinking, even though it's just wine, I was drinking it in front of the kids and drinking a whole bottle with all three of my kids there. And it's like, you know, I'm really hard on myself. Um, so I did, I kicked myself in the ass for it. And, so, but Jessica had brought something up about, cause the one thing I really kicked myself in the ass for is it's like, wow, you've done all this work and you just relapsed. You just like lost it all, you know? And I made myself believe that kind of in my head. It's like, you've done all of this and now you're back to square one. Like you're going to have to start over and all of this stuff. And then the, the thought too of like, you know, alcohol is very much normalized. It's legal. Yeah. And that's difficult because I didn't even know I had an issue with it until I started really breaking it down and looking at it and like, just like talking it out like this with people realizing that I have always turned to alcohol as a crutch when I wasn't using other stuff. Right. No, right. it wasn't necessarily my drug of choice, but I always turned to it when I was trying to come off something else. Right. And then, so it was a problem for me. And I've just had to be able to accept like in my, for me personally, that I have an addictive personality and that's anything, you know, with sugar. I mean, oh my God, I could, I can throw down on some cake, on some donuts, you know, like. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> When you have a relapse, it's more, it's not so much that you lose your time. It's more, a, a, well, the way I look at it is that I've gained experience. Now I know here's another notch on my list of things I can't do. Yeah. So I try to look at it as me learning, uh, learning more about myself. You know what I'm saying? Instead Absolutely. of saying, shit, I got to start my time all over again. Fuck yeah. that, dude. I don't even think about that part. I don't even, honestly, if somebody has a little slip like that or a lapse like that, I don't say, I don't pressure them to like start their time over. What I believe they should do is like evaluate their laps, look at it, learn from it and, and gain experience from it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that way they can go back and say, okay, I've learned now that it's not healthy for me to drink wine. And, and it, cause it, it just takes me to tequila and then it takes me to this. And then I end up doing this. So, you know what I'm saying? So as long as you oh, learn yeah. from that experience, that's, that's good. And that's healthy. Absolutely. And that, that was the thing is I, I was because I think because of all the time I had had in recovery, I got a little comfortable one yeah. and two, I had a lot of experience with um, boundaries, things that I never had before, all these different things. So I knew the warning signs. I knew the red flags and I caught it quickly. And I was proud of myself for that because, you know, before I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to stop at a drink or whatever, but I was able to stop myself and step back and say, okay, girl, like you're, you can't be doing this, you know? And I, the thing that I've had to learn to accept, and this is just, man, everybody's journey is different, but for me, 
I can't drink. I, I can't drink. Um, because yeah, I may be able to have a drink tonight, but it can also trigger something to make me want to drink every week because I had one drink last night. Well, I can have one drink next week. My brain just doesn't work like some people, you know, and you know, that was kind of hard to like accept too, because like I said, it's so normalized. So I'm like, okay, well maybe one day, maybe one day I'll be able to go have a drink, you know, with my friends out and about. But for me, that's not possible. And I had to be able to accept that. I really did. That was something I, I had to kind of come to terms with. Because when I was first talking it out with myself, I was like, well, yeah, you know, if I go out with the girls every once in a while, that is no big deal. But it is for me. It, it's literally a matter of back, going backwards for me. Because it, it happened so quick. And that is all I needed to see to see like, I can't drink. <laughs> And that's just me. And, you know, um, I can't dwell on, well, hopefully one day I can, you know, I can't, I just, I can't do that. I got to stay rooted in now. And right now I cannot do it. <laughs> you drive no, yourself no. crazy thinking about someday. I mean, it, oh it, yes, 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 yes. If I focused on all, what well, may, maybe one day I'll be able to shoot meth like everybody else can. <laughs> I mean, like what? Come on now, girl. Like, why a, do I feel like I need to take these substances into my body to make me have fun? Yeah. Why can't I just be me and 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 people have fun that's being with me sober? Yeah. See, that's you know? my goal. That's what I'm working towards. Is I want to accept me for who I am, sober. Love me, sober be able to work through my emotions and have boundaries and have healthy relationships sober and love myself sober because that's something I was never able to do um, before. And those like, you know, anything that impairs that is it helping me towards that goal. So that's a big motivator for me is like, I've came a long way. I, I hated myself. I, I did. I hated myself. And, you know, of course, I still have little self things here and there. But my recovery, I've learned to love myself and really show myself love, something I never did before. You know, um, what I will say, and you made a video, that's that's basically my story. But you made a video a few weeks back about um, loving someone like being an addict and loving someone in a, like being on both sides of addiction. Yeah. And I, that's something I'm currently going through and struggling with now um, with my mom. Mm -hmm. And she recently had a pretty severe relapse. And I had never been on this side of it, really. Um, like I said, my mama kind of always, you like, I don't, not like a daily, but she would use, you know, and I just never knew. But it's now gotten to this point where it is very much a known thing and it's very much affecting her life and um, all of her loved ones, you know, and she's doing, going, doing a lot of the same things I've done, things that she would have never done before. Um, she's lost a lot of weight. She doesn't like, there's just so many things and it's been hard to navigate through because I know as an addict myself that that's not, her in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it's not, it's that it's just part of addiction. It's just a part of it. And, um, I'm trying to help her, you know what I mean? Like in every way I can without enabling her, but being supportive and understanding and not judgmental and like letting her know, like, I love her and I understand and I'm here to, if she needs me, but it is, it's hard to navigate through that. And I think when you've been on both sides, it's hard no matter what. It's hard no matter what. So I'm not like comparing. The hardest thing I've ever done is love somebody that has an addiction. Yeah. Yeah. I would, listen to me. I would go back to my active addiction any day. But let, but, but seeing my husband relapse and going through that, it was the most, it was devastating. It was painful. If my yeah. mom was an addict and she relapsed, I don't, I, I, I can't explain. It's like it consumes your whole life. It does. It does. It's and so it is hard. And it affects your your mental health, too, in a lot of ways. And that's been something like that I'm currently dealing with and having to put boundaries in place to make sure I'm staying in a good place and not putting myself in a bad spot 
while also still trying to be supportive and loving and everything I need to be for her. But unfortunately, she's in a place of denial right now, really bad and not being honest with herself or my, or me. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's difficult, you know, and I just pray that she'll get there and she knows, like, she knows, I know that's the thing is she knows, I know, but she's still in that denial, you know, and I just let her know and remind her that I'm always and there's here. There's nothing you can do when they're doing that, when they're, the, when they're denying and they're in, oh, they're, yeah. oh, I don't have a problem. Who me? What are you talking about? Like, it's like, you might as well just say, okay, mom, I love you. <laughs> Yep. I'll check back in with me in a couple of days or, you know, let me know how you're doing you because are. I drive you insane. Yeah. And, and it's hard when it's when you're really close to you like that too, because it's like, you know, it's hard when it's a friend or anything, but when it's someone you're really close to like that, that is like, my mama's my best friend mm -hmm. is my best friend. She is my best friend. And the distance that this is like, I've not seen, I've not talked to her in over like a, a while. Um, and until like we were, we were seeing each other on a daily basis, a, a weekly basis, talking every day, texting every day. And now it's very short, you know, um, very short. I don't hear from her as much as I was. And I know it's where she's at. I know what she's doing. And she knows I know, <laughs> even though I get it too from her perspective because she's my mother. So she don't want to disappoint me. She doesn't want me to feel you know, any type of way. So she don't want to tell me these things. And I get that because that's how I felt, you know, when I was in active addiction, I didn't want to tell my mom, I didn't want to disappoint her. So I know that that plays a big part in it, but I keep trying to tell her like, it's okay. I know. And I love you and I don't judge you, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like they, you just got to be able to get there for yourself, I guess. And it doesn't matter. You can say all the right things, but until they're ready, there's just nothing you can really do about it. The best thing I did for my husband was I just let, I fell back. I had to stop doing what I was doing and fell back and let him kind of like, I just let my husband uh, fall on his face basically. Cause I kept trying to save him from his consequences. I kept doing things That's like calling thing. into his job for him or if like I could see like with probably with your mom or something like what if she fell behind on rent and you might pay rent for her one month or if she just those little things that you you think you're helping because you're like, I don't want nothing bad to happen to her. Oh, she's out of gas. She broke down on the side of the road. Let me go put some gas in her tank. Anything yep. like that. That's, we've just, done that. We've done that many. That's what I was sitting here thinking of. There's been many times I've put gas in her tank because she's out of gas on the side of the road. She came like the, the last few times I've seen her. That's the only reason I've seen her is because she needed gas money <clears throat> and and i i told my husband i was like it's so hard because i know it's enabling you know it it is but it's so hard because i don't want her to be on the side of the road so i told him i was like we just we can't do it no more we just can't and it's hard it's it's hard <laughs> it's been really hard i know Believe me, I know. And you know what? And you, you'll just take your time, take time. And eventually you'll just get to a point where you work your way up. Like I could tell you to stop doing that, but you got to work on your own time to stop, to get to a point where you're going to say, mom, I love you, but I can't keep doing this. Like, cause what's happening is she's never going to learn that. Hey, I got to make sure that I keep gas in my car or else I'm going to run out. And so when she starts experiencing being on the side of the road and have to walk the rest of the way home, that's going to make her remember. Yeah. I don't want to run out next time. You know what I mean? I remember that shit. Oh, yeah. 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 And I will say, she's not asked me a whole bunch, but what she, another thing, she has asked a couple of times, and an, and another thing that she's that she's gotten real good at is manipulation. And um, like knowing that I know something and like straight bold face lie to me just to get her way about something. Yeah. And that that's the hardest part I think is just that you know not being able to trust the one person you've never not trusted and it's hard it's hard to stay in to stay rooted in the reality of this isn't her this is just the addiction right Do not take it personal you know it's hard, hard to take it personal and um you know I'm like I said I'm my only 
the only child that she has and I'm grown and she has grandchildren that are her whole life. So it's, it's really hard, but I always have to remind myself you like, I know I've been there and I know, and you know, it's just hard to stay there in the middle of knowing and understanding and, and supporting and loving and not taking it personal. And it's, you know what I mean? Cause it, it does. I know what you mean. It hurts real it has bad. Nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing to do with you. And I, I understand because I was the same way. I kept thinking, you're thinking this. Does she not love me? Does she not love her grandbabies enough to want to quit using? If she did, she would stop using drugs. That's how I felt about my husband. He must not love me. He must not really want to be with me. He must not want to take care of our son. That's why he keeps doing this. And that's what you're thinking. But she's that has nothing to do with it. She yeah. loves those grandbabies. She loves you, obviously. I mean, she was carrying you around with her when she was little, when you were a little baby and y'all were staying in a car. That's how much she loved you is that she didn't yeah. want to get you taken away, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so she's it's always just been a damn again. addiction. It, yeah, and, it's, and it sucks. And I, and I know she's got a... Because... <sighs> I've even thought about the whole, like getting them committed. Like we've talked about me and my husband's talked about like, Oh, what you got to go through and all this stuff. But we tried to do that with his brother. And it, it just, it just does come back down to the fact that you can do it all. You can spend all the money. You can spend all the time, but if that person is not ready, it's not going to make any difference. And then you're just going to be out of money and time and yeah. still in the same predicament. And I know people feel different, like differently about it, but it's just like, I know that she has to get there and want it herself. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that addiction is a disease it's a part of mental health illness. Yeah, me too. And I think that if she would go to a psychiatrist and start working on those things, it would drastically, drastically help so much. So that's what I'm working on. I'm trying to get her talked into going and talking to somebody because I think that would be the a really good and MAT. I'm trying to get her into an MAT thing, but you know, she's got to do it. I'm just trying to help her, you know, that would be the best thing she could do. Get into MAT and get into therapy. Yeah. Tell her, say going into medication assisted treatment, like they're going to help her to be comfortable. So she's not going to, she could, that would be the best thing. And she, yeah, and still, she knows it too, because she, she did, she was in an MAT thing for like four or five years, did amazing. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, things happen in her life, different things. And it just, she quit going and we, and there's no, there's no, I've told her a thousand times, there's no shame in that. Like, just go back. You just, do yeah. it they're used to it. You know how many times I like messed up while I was in there, not drug tests, but just different things. Bottle recalls didn't show up, didn't yeah. make it there before the doors closed. And they, they're ready for that. You know what I mean? They're most of those facilities are prepared and no, they're not going to kick you out. They're not going to whatever they're there to, to help. Um, and that's what I told her. I was like, nobody's judging you, but you, if, you if know, she goes back, they're going to be proud of her. They're going to be excited to see her. Oh yeah. They, every time it did not matter. They were always so happy to see me come back in. You know what I mean? Like when I, the first time I tried to go to a monthly facility, I really screwed up and then ended up because I was so used to that day to day. It was a lot of responsibility at once and I, and I screwed up yeah. and um, I ended up going back to the, the, that place that was a day to day situation. And they were so happy to see me. Like they were so happy to see me back in there. And I told them, I said, I tried the monthly thing. It didn't work for me. I'm not ready yet. You know, and it's, it takes time, but I think finding a good facility because I know not all facilities are the same, but yeah, we were, we were lucky in that aspect around here to where we do have a really good facility where there's people that work there. A lot of them have experience with addiction. So that kind of helps too, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I'm currently going through. And I will say like, I'm doing good, but the, this has been the hardest thing mentally and keeping my, my re like recovery in the forefront and just because the thoughts have been there and you know I've had to talk to my own sponsor and there's been moments where I've had to like just back away from her because it has affected my recovery and I know she's not she's not intentionally doing none of it it's not her fault but you know it's just me and something that I'm struggling with so 
that's that's the hardest part it's just keeping those boundaries in check to where I'm not putting myself in a bad place to try to help her, yeah. you know, but yeah, I guess that's so amazing girl. <laughs> Thank you. You told your story really good. I'm very, I'm I, uh, quite I impressed if you want to know the truth. Thank you did really, you. really good. You got me very emotional on a couple of parts of it too, which is thought. I mean, I don't really get emotional uh, when I have guests on, but you're talking about your dad, man. Damn. I was yeah. about that really teared. Oh, me. and there's so much that I, I left out to like I like because I was how long has it been? Like two hours. Like, oh, you so have we, been my longest speaking guest so far. <laughs> that does not surprise me. That does not surprise that's good. me. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Well, that's I awesome. ask every guest that comes on, I ask them one question before they uh, leave. So I want to ask you this question. So I want you to think about the people that are in the audience that are on the other side of the world or wherever they're at. And they're watching this video right now and they're in their active addiction. They're getting high, but they don't want to be like that anymore. They're trying, they want to change. What would you say to the person on the other end of the screen that's struggling right now and they're afraid to reach out for help? And they're afraid to reach out for help. I would say... If you, if you have the, if you have the want for better, then there's no reason to be afraid because the worst thing that's going to happen is that you relapse and you can always fix that. You can always start, you know, take, like they say, one day at a time, but you won't know until you try it, until you actually try to see how it works. And who knows? It may just work for you. And again, the worst thing is a relapse, which you can fix the very next day. Wake up, do it again. Show yourself some grace. Don't think too much into it. Don't overthink it because that's, I think, a big thing as addicts too, is we we already have so much mental like stuff on us that people do not even realize. We've already said all the horrible stuff to ourselves. We do it on a daily and that's a hard habit to break. So show yourself some grace and just do it. And yeah, that's what I would say. Just don't be so hard on yourself and just do it. <laughs> just I do agree. It. Just do it. I really do agree. This is what I want you to do. So I'm going to post this video. I got to change the title to Cassie, but I already changed the thumbnail. Everybody. So it's Cassie, not Cassandra. I'm sorry. I called you that. I just automatically assumed, but I told everybody Cassie when we started the video. And um, what I want you to do, will you send me the links to your YouTube channel and all the places that you want people to follow you? Cause I'm going to put it in the description box and in the comment section you know, pinned in the comment section of this video. And Absolutely. I was so grateful that you came on and I would love to do another video yeah. in a couple of months where you yeah, come on and you tell us about maybe, maybe kind of give us an update on how your mom is doing. I would like love that. that. Yeah, I would love that. Um, I definitely will. Uh, and yeah, I'll send you that stuff. And maybe I was, I'll, I'll message you behind the scenes, but I was actually going to see if you wanted to come over on my second channel to talk yeah. about stuff too. So I will. I'm we'll always game. Out. But thank y'all. Thank you, Nicole. I'm, I really appreciate it. I was so nervous, but I was like, I've watched these. I've I've been watching you, adore you. And I was like, okay, I know her being there is going to make it so much easier because it can be kind of hard to know where to start and like to navigate through stuff. You did amazing. You did, uh, you did phenomenal. Like Thank really you. you did a great job. Uh, you seem like you are a natural at, at storytelling, at telling your story. So you did a I good think job. it comes naturally after a while. I remember the first time I turned the camera on, I was so nervous, but now it's like second nature. You know? Yeah, I love talking on here. <laughs> me too, me too. I do too. And <laughs> thank everybody in chat too. I'm sorry. I'm trying to check my phone and check because I can't see it on this end. But right. thank you all so much for, um, for being here. And for supporting me, I really appreciate it. I've seen a couple of messages going by saying stuff. So I'll try to catch up with like the replay. <laughs> Thank you so much, girl. I love you. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to take you girl. off here because Nate and Neil just got home and I'm going to go get um, Nate something to eat, but Good I'm going to message you on Instagram and get all your links. Okay. All right. Good night y'all. Bye, Bye baby.
Okay, you guys. I got emotional during her uh, her story time. And y'all know I'm an emotional person. But, damn, that really got me emotional talking about her dad and everything. She did a really freaking good job sharing her story. I hope a lot of you guys could relate to it. I could relate to a lot of her story, especially when she got into talking about, you know, um, her second baby and having to get on MAT. And she's a great example, you guys, of like, if you're somebody out there who's pregnant and you're using drugs right now, I'm so glad she talked about that. There's nothing to be ashamed of. If you need to get help, if you are on drugs and you are pregnant, reach out. Do not be ashamed. Okay. You can message me. I won't tell a soul and I'll help you get treatment. So that way you and your baby are safe. Okay. That's like a really big thing that I like talking about on my channel is addiction and pregnancy because I didn't get help and I could have lost my son. You know, and so I don't want any of you guys. I don't want nobody to do what I did. I don't want people to, to use drugs while they're pregnant, you know. And so if you're somebody out there and you're a woman and you're struggling with addiction and you're pregnant, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's it's really not hard at all to get the help. I can hook you up and we can. You will be, you know, good to go. You know what I'm saying? So. That really was really important to me. I'm so glad that she talked about that in the video. And basically, I hope by hearing everybody's stories that we bring on, that you guys hear these stories. And if you haven't experienced something like this, that you will learn from our experiences so you don't make the same mistakes. And if you have already made the same mistakes we have, I hope by hearing our stories, it will help you feel not so alone. I hope it'll make you realize that we all have been through some shit, you know, and there's nothing to be ashamed of. That's what we're all here for is to help each other by sharing our stories, you know, but uh, I'm a I'm a mess emotionally today. <laughs> I love you guys. And I hope you guys enjoyed Cassie's story. I'm going to get this video up and get her links. So that way you guys can find her and um, yeah, I love you guys. Okay. And I'll see y'all tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. So tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, we will be live. Hold on. Let me put the link in the chat. I will be live with my patrons. So if you're a patron of mine or you want to become one, okay, here is my Patreon link. It's only $2. Um, and if or uh, it's only two dollars to join, if you want to do recovery coaching, that's that's forty five dollars a month. But the regular tier is just two bucks. You join and we go live every Friday at six p.m. Central Standard Time together. Okay, so if you want to join, come on with it. There's a link in the chat. I love you guys, and I'm gonna get this video up and go get this boy fed. Okay, all right. Come on, Paco.